I think it's really hard when you've been doing something this way for so many years of your life. Um, and I, it's almost kind of mind blowing when you think, huh, you know, I've been so focused on the end goal that I have, I'm not even realizing all the small wins to get to that point. And I think a lot of times too, I think people will so focus on the end game and then they get there and then they make that next goal. And so then they don't even celebrate the fact that they're there, right? They're already looking way further towards the next thing. And so you, during that whole process, you miss out on the opportunity to be present and um, appreciative of what you've done and the changes you've made. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and today we are joined again by one of our Zibli Health coaches, Dr. Lydia Spirok, and we are talking about things to stop doing to lose weight and keep it off in 2024 and beyond. And this is one of my favorite types of episodes to do, Lydia, because I think so many people come to us and they're like, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. And sometimes it's not about doing more. It's about stopping doing things that are ineffective and counterproductive to Mm -hmm. reaching one's goals. So this will kind of be a casual conversation. I hope people can really resonate with the points here and reflect, okay, am I doing that? Can I stop doing that? Does this one, you know, resonate with me? Um, And then if you have any other ones that you want to add to this list, I'd love to hear them. Sure. So absolutely. The first one that I put on this list was to stop going on a diet. So I think that might surprise people because we're a health coaching program. And I think a lot of people assume like, well, don't you just tell us to go on a diet? And it's like, no, we have a different definition of diet. There's a short-term diet and a long-term diet definition. Mm -hmm. And if you look it up, diet is like the way in which you habitually eat. And that's the approach that we take. So um, I would love to hear your feedback on just personal experience or client experience for people that have gone on a diet Mm -hmm. and then not been successful with long-term weight loss. Sure. I, I think so many people, um, you know, they think that that's the right approach. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to change my ways, but usually whatever approach that they're using for this quote diet is it, it is, it isn't sustainable. Right. And that's what we, um, be really put into practice at Zivli is, is small changes for sustained, um, like your sustained lifestyle. And a lot of these other diet programs, it's all about how can I lose the most weight in the shortest amount of time? And people may or may not lose that weight. And then six months later, later, they regain that weight and even more weight. And it's because these quote diets, they're not made up of Mm -hmm. long-term practical habits and um, lifestyle change. And I think that's, that's the key that a lot of people are missing. I agree. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one thing that comes to mind are stories of old Weight Watchers meetings, Mm. like where they got up on the scale and they lost like a half a pound a week and their coach just kind of shamed them. And they're like, Mm -hmm. well, did you really try? And they're like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. Right. And so I think a lot of people begin a weight loss journey with weight loss in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we really encourage people to begin a weight loss journey with the long-term goal Mm -hmm. of long-term weight loss in mind. And that, that, requires a different approach. It requires a slower, more gentle approach. And, um, I've been kind of open and talking about the parallels that I've experienced in growing a business to, Mm -hmm. um, helping people get healthy. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that the biggest lessons that I've learned is you can't build an unsustainable business and expect to be happy. Mm-hmm. Like starting out, you know, I was, I lost more sleep from my business than I did my newborn son. Cause I was oh my like, gosh. for real, for real, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you. 
Um, I would stay up all night and work on like a blog, fixing my blog or like I built seven websites, Lydia, like oh my website platform. You can probably bet that I've built a website on it. And building a website is a lot of work. Forever. It takes forever. <laughs> it took me four months to build my first website that I probably kept for like two, you know, it was oh my really gosh. ridiculous. And what I realized was I wanted to do this to impact people mm-hmm. and help people but also create a lifestyle that allowed me to be a present mom Mm -hmm. and just have a relaxed, easy, stress-free lifestyle where I didn't have to like go through red tape or go to a manager. If I, if I had an idea, like I just wanted to to, to help people, you know, (laughs) unfortunately in healthcare, we are very shackled by Mm -hmm. insurance regulations and uh, management sometimes. And productivity standards. I just, I wanted to be done with all that. Yeah. But what I realized was I was so stressed out a couple of years into my business. And I was like, well, I can't continue on this trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people get to that point with their weight loss. Like they're like white knuckling their way there Yeah, and they get there and they're like, I cannot sustain this. I can't keep going this way. And I think it's really important for people to recognize that if it doesn't feel easy and light and doable as you're building your healthy lifestyle, or like for me, as I'm building this business, it's not going to feel easy and light and sustainable and doable when you build it, when you build your lifestyle. So I think a lot of people misattribute feelings to like weight loss Mm -hmm. that aren't true. They think, I'll be so much more relaxed and proud of myself and mm-hmm. confident when I lose weight. And that's a lie. Yeah. It's like if you're not relaxed and proud of yourself and confident on the way down, those feelings don't magically appear. Right. I think a lot of people are, they go in with that mindset of, I just have to keep pushing through. I just have to, like, I got to keep going. I got to keep pushing. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it, there shouldn't be that much resistance, right? With something that, is that should be sustainable and a total kind of lifestyle change um, in a good way, it shouldn't be hard in the sense of it should be, it should fit seamlessly into your life. Yep. And I think check the energy behind your motivation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so is it a frenetic, urgent energy? Right. Because that's going to drive you to quote unquote, go on a short-term diet and focus on weight loss. Right. Or is this more of an inspired? enlightened, um, light energy Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. you're just like, I'm so excited to embark on this health journey and finally put my health first versus like, I've got to lose this weight. I feel like crap and I have a vacation coming up or I have a wedding come up and I need to get in the stress. And I've tried all these different things and yeah. Yeah. So I think that's like the biggest tip from like, stop going on a diet and check Mm -hmm. your energy behind your actions. Yeah. Be sure that it's coming from that place of calm, peaceful, serenity, confidence, whatever feelings you want to create with the outcome that you want, you have to feel those along the way. And yep. going on a diet usually does not facilitate those feelings. It no. usually facilitates <laughs> feelings of like white knuckling, putting a lot of pressure on yourself to be perfect. Uh, usually spending a lot of money that's not a sustainable amount of money over time to be spending on this, like Mm -hmm. weight loss medications, like semaglutide or uh, Nutrisystem or Octavia or like a lot of those meal replacement type of things. Right. It's interesting. There's a lot of parallels too with this, even with, within the field of physical therapy as a physical therapist, um, you know, we, we have that, that term frequent flyers, meaning we see these people consistently that come in. Um, and it's interesting, um, you know, when I, when I speak and talk to some of my, my clients, um, in the physical therapy realm, it's like, they don't want to keep coming in, you know, they love PT, but they don't want to keep coming, right. They don't want to keep falling. They don't want to keep being injured and coming in. And, um, you know, it, I've had some conversations even with them, you know, I'll say, I'm going to take my PT hat off and let me put my health coaching hat on. And, Let's just talk about what would life look like if you were no longer having to come through this cycle of I get injured and I have to go to PT again. And it's kind of the same thing. There are some parallels even with, you know, diet and lifestyle, right? I don't want to keep going on the cycle of I do a diet, I lose weight, I gain weight, I do a diet, right? You know, we got to break off the cycle and just 
have a, a, a smooth path that's just constant. So yeah, I like to say too, that the changes that you make should almost feel insignificant. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can't remember who said it. Um, but someone said something like, you know, what really makes someone successful are the little things. The problem Mm -hmm. is the little things are easy to do, but they're also easy not to do. Right. And so the little things are important. So let's move on to the second one, uh, which is in my opinion, stop trying to do it all. Mm. And, and I think if you aren't sure, like, okay, am I trying to do it all again, check the energy behind your actions. I think some signs that you're trying to do too much. I, the first one would be overwhelm mm-hmm. in my opinion. Um, and what's really difficult, what was really startling for me to figure out is when I feel overwhelmed, mm-hmm. when I feel disappointed, mm-hmm. when I feel like someone popped my bubble and all of my air left me, or like I'm a cardboard box and someone stomped on me. Mm-hmm. That's my fault. That's my fault because I had the preconceived expectations of an outcome. And if I didn't get that outcome, I feel disappointed. And so it was a really big lesson for me to learn that any disappointment that I'm feeling is not because of an external outcome. Mm -hmm. It's not because of a number on the scale or because of something that someone did. It's my own expectations and my, more importantly, my attachment to those expectations. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, like, that's what this one means is really releasing the attachment to expectations because that attachment is, it it enslaves you. And then if you Mm -hmm. don't reach that goal, that outcome, if you're not losing a certain amount of weight, if your A1C is not where you want it, if your pants aren't fitting how you want yet, you're always kind of affected by external circumstances, right? Instead of using your power, your personal power to create the external circumstances you want, you're just draining your power with right. negative energy. So what do I you think th- about that one? I think for me, um, I totally agree with everything that you're saying. When I think about it in my head, um, you know, for example, during coaching sessions I may have with someone, you know, we create these these action items um, at the end of our call, you know, very small things that they can implement today. Um, I also call them experiments um, because I think it goes along with what you're saying of you're removing um, or you're, you're removing that attachment yeah. and that that emotion to whatever that thing is. And so I tell people, you know, and in the science community, an experiment is you're never, you know, failing or succeeding. You're gaining knowledge from that experiment. And that's the exact same um, thinking you need when you're putting these small actions in place in your own life. Right. You're not you're not failing or succeeding. You're gaining knowledge in some capacity that's only going to help propel you forward. Um, and I, I think that that sometimes helps people because they know I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. It was an experiment. I tried it and I learned from it. And now I'm going to go forward and do things maybe a little differently. I think that's a great way to say it. It's like checking the energy behind your action again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, are you being rigid? Are you being, are you, is this an all or nothing? Like if this doesn't work, then I I give up because I think that we hear that a lot. We hear a Mm -hmm. lot of people come to us. Like I've tried everything. Literally I've tried everything and they're just disheartened and they're discouraged. Um, I like the analogy of the experiment. I also like it as like a coat, especially with mm-hmm. action items. It's like you're shopping at the store. You're going to try on a shirt. And if you don't like the shirt, fine, you can take it off and you can try a different action item next week. Right. But we want to get in the habit of being consistent and intentional with our actions. I'm really excited. Um, later in this episode, we're going to discuss the topic of inertia. Speaking of science, mm. um, I read something this morning and very serendip- ser- serendipitously um, I was like, this is a perfect insert to this podcast recording. So Ooh, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Get excited. Number two is again, stop trying to do it all. And I think it's not that you can't do it all, mm-hmm. but I don't think you can do it all at the same time, especially mm-hmm. if you're starting to build healthy habits. Like you can't be focusing on your protein and your water and your exercise and your sleep and your stress management all at once. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly why we created our Zibli habit hierarchy to help people prioritize their attention on 
what are the best habits to implement in what order so that subsequent mm-hmm. habits are easier to implement? Mm-hmm. So I think that really gives our members really clear focus on where to where to start, you know? where to even begin. Yeah, where to begin. Um, so this next one is oh, so good. It's so good, especially in light of what I said of releasing your attachment to your expectations that create disappointment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's to stop focusing on the distance ahead. And mm-hmm. so I have not personally read the book, The Gap and the Gain. Have you read that one? I haven't. Have you Sounds heard like the one? No, but I, I have a feeling I know the so idea. <laughs> it's so simple. And it's so great for, you know, people who struggle with the all or nothing mindset, people mm-hmm. who are perfectionists or recovering perfectionists, yeah. uh, high achievers, especially mm-hmm. can really benefit from this philosophy. Mm-hmm. So the gap in the gain, again, haven't read the book, but it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory from what I've heard. Mm-hmm. Um, high achievers, especially tend to focus on the gap of where they are now mm-hmm. compared to where they want to be mm-hmm. and where they want to be is always a mirage. It's like you're walking in the desert and you see water. There's not actually water there, right? It's always a moving target. So you're mm-hmm. never going to be satisfied if you're always focusing on how much weight you have left to lose, how much, mm-hmm. how much lower your A1C still has to go, how you still can't fit into the clothes in your closet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the opposite of that, the solution is to focus on your gains. Mm-hmm. And I do this a lot when I coach people in office hours. Um, the gains, honest to goodness, should be as micro as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, Yesterday in office hours, I asked someone for their wins for the month. We were doing our traction time and she said, I'm eating protein. Um, I think maybe a water or something like that, like drinking water, eating protein. Okay, great. But let's get more granular and specific. Like how is your emotional state? How are you Mm -hmm. reacting to things? Like I want to know those tiny wins because that, that in like that deep focus on your gains is what will Mm -hmm. keep you moving forward because it feels so good to do so. Right. Focusing on your gains instead of the gap. Um, so that's what this point means. Like as you know, stop, you know, focusing on the distance ahead and start focusing on how far you've come. Mm -hmm. Any examples from your own life or clients experience for that one? I think, well, one, I will say, I think this is I totally agree with this, you know, this point, the step, I think it's really hard when you've been doing something this way for so many years of your life. Um, And I, it's almost kind of mind blowing when you think, huh, you know, I've been so focused on the end goal that I have, I'm not even realizing all the small wins to get to that point. And I think a lot of times too, I think people will so focus on the end game and then they get there and then they make that next goal. And so then they don't even celebrate the fact that they're there, right? They're already looking way further towards the next thing. And so you, during that whole process, you miss out on the opportunity to be present and um, appreciative of what you've done and the changes you've made. Um, So it's, I, I love this step. I think this is fantastic. Um, I had one, um, one client recently and we were talking about her wins and she was so focused on the fact that I haven't, you know, this is the amount of weight I want to lose. And I, I haven't achieved that yet. And I'm, I'm really frustrated by it. And so we had to break down some, some non-scale victories. And so we pointed out the fact that she hadn't gained any weight. And previously she had been continuously gaining weight. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, 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 you know, I paused her and I said, wait a minute, that's yeah. a huge win right there. Right. You're not, you're not adding on, but she was so focused on, well, that, that ideal number I have, I'm not, I'm not, you know, getting there like I thought I would be. And I, and I said, you are though, you know, and so that took a little bit of reframing and then um, another one of her small um, kind of victories were it was a non-scale, you know, clothing victory. Things were fitting way better than before. And, you know, so we paused and she was like, I didn't even think about that. You know, I just, yeah. I put on my pants and I just kept on going. And I, yeah. I said, yeah, but they fit so much better now. And how does that make you feel? She was like, well, I, I wasn't as, you know, self-conscious in, in what I was wearing. And I didn't even realize that in the moment, I just put my pants on and I, and I went and, you know, I think that does go 
back to the the idea of we we think so far in the future we've got to stop and be present and look at those wins and what's happening around us I love that you brought up being present. That was definitely something I was thinking of as you were speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also just want to reiterate her frustration came from her own expectations of a certain amount of weight that she had to lose. And once we take full responsibility for our own expectations Mm -hmm. and our own thoughts, we can have power to release that feeling of disappointment. That's totally counterproductive in the first place. Right. Um, so I love that. So stop focusing on the distance ahead. One other thing that I wanted to add as a pinpoint from what you said, Mm -hmm. you said, that's how we, that's how we've been trained. Mm -hmm. We've been trained to set goals, smart goals, right? Right. Specific, measurable, achievable, Mm -hmm. realistic, time bound, whatever acronym words you want to fit in there. Um, but we have not been trained to praise ourselves. That's, that's, you know, conceited. That's prideful. That's right. selfish. We haven't been trained in gratitude. We haven't been mm-hmm. trained in identifying our wins and being our own cheerleader. We've mm-hmm. been trained that we are good when somebody else tells us that we're good instead of telling, you know, we have to really create that. And a great example, I think that this is human nature, Lydia, mm-hmm. to focus on the negative. My son came home yesterday and very in tune energetically, especially with my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, And I could tell something was off and he's five, he's in kindergarten. So it can't be anything too big. Like, (laughs) but something was off. And I was like, buddy, um, what's going on? You know, he hid from me and he, he he didn't want to talk about it. So I sat him on my lap and I hugged him and I said, no matter what happens at school, I want you to know that you are loved and you are accepted and you are Mm -hmm. just perfect the way that you are. And I always love you. And I always want to hear what you're thinking. Um, especially if something's upsetting you. And he was like, (laughs) he said, I spilled the orange juice today. (laughs) (laughs) We had gone to, he went to Ronza, I I don't know, we sometime and he got like the little kids, uh, Mandarin oranges containers. And like, every time you open them, that juice sprays out. It goes everywhere. "Mm -hmm." Usually I open it and then I drink some of the juice so that it's less likely for him to spill. And the the lady that helped him open the juice, like the oranges obviously did not drink the juice. So then he spilled some on the table and then his friend um, said, oh, you spilled some juice. Like, and then that that's all he could think about the rest of the day. Oh, He's like, mom, I, he's, he literally, he's like, mom, I keep thinking about what went bad. Oh, Right. But I think that's human nature to think yeah. about our negative, our negative aspects, what went wrong in the day. Right. I mean, how many of us have had that, like, especially in patient care right. where you might have, a, you know, 50 great interactions with your coworkers or patients, mm-hmm. or you feel like you've helped somebody, but then someone was a real pain <laughs> mm-hmm. or someone, you know, said something unkind or sent a nasty email or criticized you. And then you focus on that for the rest of the day. Right. That one bad thing negates all the good that yes. happened from the day. Yeah. Yes. And as Tony Robbins says, like where focus goes, energy flows. Mm-hmm. So his focus was on spilling the juice, feeling embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And that's where all of his energy went. So what, other, what else could he have done with that energy? I wonder what right. else can people who are trying to lose weight and get healthy do with their energy? If they're not constantly focused on their disappointment of how far they have to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that that's just important. We aren't trained in this way. We have to train our brains. We have to retrain our brains. So, all right, let's move on to the next one. Love this. Uh, Also goes to expectations. Stop expecting instant results. Mm -hmm. Immediate gratification. It's tough, isn't it? It's really hard. I think that's. Again, it goes back to retraining your thoughts and it's not the culture we live in. We, you know, we do something and we expect the results immediately, right? I, you know, we're out of baby wipes. I'm going to order them on Amazon and they'll come tomorrow. You know, we're used to those immediate results. You know, I sent an email, I expect an email back quickly, you know, Um, and long-term sustainable results don't happen immediately, you know, and it's that concept too of, well, 
you didn't, you, you didn't, um, you know, maybe gain 40 pounds overnight. And so it's that same concept going forward. It can't be lost in, you know, in a day. But I think when people find what they want, they want it quickly. (laughs) And that's just the the culture we live in. And we need a little reframing and work on our mindset with that for sure. Yeah. And we're actually adding a new course lesson for this Mm -hmm. January launch about our five Zivli choices. And that's kind of something that just, I don't know how that came up. I don't know if Mm -hmm. it was when you joined our team or Mm -hmm. if it just, I felt like it was something that was naturally boiling, like within our membership, Mm -hmm. these qualities and these characteristics of people who are very successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we need to, we need to emphasize these. We need to teach these qualities Mm -hmm. because I think it will help people get over that all or nothing mindset, instant gratification mindset, it will help them stay the course. And so Mm -hmm. just to review like what our five choices are, it's growth. And so I'm just going to read them. These are on our website if people want to check them out. So having a growth mindset allows you to be patient with the process of getting healthy and appreciate valuable insights and understandings otherwise missed. Authenticity. Uh, So to engage with genuine and realistic behavior change, authenticity is required. We ask for your vulnerability and honesty with yourself and us. I have a side note to add to that after I finish these. Um, This is important uh, for the instant gratification part of this persistence. So long-term change requires a long-term mindset. Life will throw you curveballs and we ask for your persistence to not quit when things get tough. Integrity. This means taking responsibility for your thoughts and actions. You do what you say you're going to do, even when it's hard and convenient or you don't feel like it. Lastly is commitment. We are committed to helping you reach your health goals. And in order to be successful, we ask for your full commitment to a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle, which does not mean being perfect. And on the authenticity point, I smiled because I don't know why I feel like one of my powers is making people cry. Like... (laughs) My superpower. <laughs> my superpower is maybe making people cry. Um, when I was growing up, I played soccer. I loved soccer and I was so much bigger. I'm only five eight, but I was a lot I matured quickly. So I was bigger sure. than all the other kids. And they would just like these little girls would just like run into me like I was <laughs> like I was a brick or something, you know? And they like, they would fall like a fly. I felt like a fly swatter. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just so much stronger than you. Um, and so playing soccer, we would count how many girls I made cry a game instead of how many goals I scored. So this started young. It started young. It started young. And it shifted from more of a physical pain, making people cry to an emotional. But I think that so many people are craving that authentic mm-hmm. connection with somebody to listen mm-hmm. to their heart, yeah. not listen to the words, but listen between the lines, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think you're so good at that. And I'm so grateful that we have you on this team. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's a really rare quality when someone can empathetically and actively listen to the heart, yeah. listen to the energy behind the words, right. and then have the courage and the confidence to draw out what people mm-hmm. are afraid to share. Right. So I think when we're talking about having that all, you know, that instant gratification mindset, mm-hmm. uh, when we're talking about encouraging people to really stop expecting instant results, all of those choices go into that. Um, because if you're going to stop doing something, you have to start doing something else. Right. And I think that's where people get a little bit lost. Like, okay, if I'm not going to expect instant results, like, well, what should I be thinking? Right. Exactly. Um, so the next one, which I'm excited, especially to talk with you about, because this was one that you kind of had added to the conversation, mm-hmm. stop having weak boundaries. Um, this includes weak boundaries around your emotional health, Mm -hmm. um, around your schedule, around how willing you are to help people, especially Mm -hmm. my mother. I I always, um, joke that my mom's, uh, new year's resolution. I think it was my new year's resolution for her was to stop, uh, offering help when it was not asked for. She's real good good. at that. She's really good at like filling up her schedule, even though nobody asked her to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So what does that mean to you? And like with your client experience and personal experience, what does that mean to you? I, well, so my, my personal experience with myself and with my other clients, I find that people, 
you know, and I tend to, to coach more women than, than men, but I think this is applicable to both. I think people are willing to set boundaries in certain areas of their life easily, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, maybe even work, you know, I'm, you know, after the hours eight to five, you, you know, I can't be contacted, um, you know, until Monday morning, you know, but <clears throat> boundaries with themselves and um, especially their, their health related boundaries. I think it's easy for them to put it on the back burner, mm-hmm. you know, and I, you know, I, I, when I talk with other people, I, I say, why is that any less important than any of the other boundaries that you've set in your life? You know, and sometimes I even question, I think that's the most important boundary to have because your life starts with you, right? You know, it's like that, um, the analogy everybody talks about with oxygen mask on the plane, you know, you have to put your own, your own on first before you help somebody else. And that's the same thing we're talking about here. You know, you have to set appropriate realistic boundaries for yourself and your health before you then go off and set boundaries in other areas, you know, of, of your life with other people. Um, but it's so easy for people to avoid setting boundaries for their own personal health. They just, they, they say it's fine. You know, I just, it's not a priority and it's like, no, it is a priority. It needs to be a priority. You know, you, you need to put yourself first. And so many of the women I talk to, you know, they're either moms or they're grandmas and that's not the life they've lived. Mm -hmm. They've put their, they put themselves last quite often. And Um, it's a total reframe of, you know, in order to be the best version of yourself or everyone else, you have to put yourself first. And that might mean setting some boundaries that might make you a little bit uncomfortable initially, but let's work through that. Yeah. And I think getting flexible with those boundaries is important Mm -hmm. too. Again, I think of my mom and I've been on her case for years to exercise. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. But she has really done a good job this year. I can mm-hmm. attest that she's been consistent. And this is the first year where she exercised at home. She's like a wild child. I tell you what. So she she um she lives near me. So she when she's at home, she bought a home gym this year. When she goes out to visit her mom at Lake McConaughey, she'll go into town or she'll go on walks. Mm -hmm. When she goes to visit my brother in Nashville, she walks outside. Like she's been really good at being adaptable. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, being adaptable with your boundaries is important, but also getting very granular and Mm -hmm. realizing every single area in your life has the opportunity to have a boundary in place. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people think of boundaries as constrictive, like Mm -hmm. that they're not boundaries, Mm -hmm. systems, processes actually allow you to be freer. Right. And I think that's kind of a a counterintuitive approach to this, but think about Mm -hmm. like boundaries around sugar. You know, that Mm -hmm. was one of the areas I started with my own progress was I'm not going to have regular desserts Monday through Friday, and I'm going to allow myself one standard size suite on Saturday or Sunday. Mm-hmm. That's a boundary. It's a right. boundary to go to bed around nine 30 every night. Mm-hmm. It's a boundary to choose to not, to not heed to children's whining. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a boundary to discipline them. It's a boundary like this goes on and on and on and on and on. Mm-hmm. And the way I explain it to my kids is I have more self-respect than to allow you to speak to me in that manner. Mm -hmm. And I will not tolerate whining because Mm -hmm. it's disrespectful and I respect myself more than that. Yeah. And so I think, as you mentioned, like we, like we can all, we can't give what we don't have. Mm -hmm. And I think as a parent, if we don't have our own boundaries, how do we teach children to have boundaries of their own? around food, around physical activity, around screen time, around Mm -hmm. sleep, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think I'm really big on like, I'm not just being healthy for myself. I'm being healthy for my kids, right? for my family. You're leading by example. Leading by example. And so I think from a boundary standpoint, let's get kind of practical with people here. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like are some of the easiest boundaries to start setting? So I talk a lot with people about time boundaries surrounding time. Um, 
you know, because a lot of times people will say, well, I just, I don't have time to, I don't have time to meal prep. I don't have time to do all of these things. And so, um, you know, I think this isn't a personal example for me. I, um, I would, I even caught myself doing this. I'd say, oh my gosh, the weekends come. I have so much to do. We don't have enough time for it all. And Mm -hmm. I realized that at this point in time, I was, my husband and I were doing activities on both days, both Saturday and Sunday. We were trying to see both sides of the family and friends and, and do everything. And I said, I think I need to set a boundary in place that one day of the weekend is going to be spent for, you know, kind of we we reset and we have some family time and that's that's my boundary. You know, I'm willing to adapt on occasion, um, you know, around holidays, things like that. But this this is my kind of my hard stop. Um, and it has been very transformational because it allows us to start our week not unbelievably stressed. You know, we're not having to then grocery shop into the week because we didn't have time to do it on Sunday because we were out visiting X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, and I think people, it's kind of the, almost an all or nothing attitude. People think, well, I have, I have to do all of these things. Um, you know, and it allows you the opportunity to say no. Mm-hmm. And we're, a lot of people are used to saying no, right? We're like a yes culture. Yes, yeah. I'll do that. Yep. Yep. I'll take on more. I'll take on more. And, um, you know, you need to give yourself the permission to say no when something doesn't feel right. Um, rather than, you know, it's going back to that. How does this feel? How does the energy feel? If I don't, if I feel like there's a lot of resistance, maybe that is a sign that I'm going to set a boundary. Um, and doesn't mean that that boundary can't be readjusted, Mm -hmm. right? Experiment with it, see how it feels, um, and make tweaks from there. I think the power of no is so important. I did a podcast Mm -hmm. episode not too long ago about an experience where I was asked to do something at our church Mm -hmm. and I had to say no to three different people for the same request. Yeah. And, um, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have done that. Right. Right. And then they say yes. And then they're like, oh, why did I say yes? I need to do mm-hmm. this now. And so I'll link that episode up in the show notes. If you're having a hard time saying no, that ep- that episode goes into why it's really important and why I believe our default response should always be no. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean like you have to tell the person no, but you can say, you know, hey, let me think about that and I'll get back to you or let me right. check my schedule. Um, but there, and I go into that into detail in like three ways to say no, kind of without saying no sure. uh, in that episode. So that one is important. Set your boundaries. Uh, I think that Lydia had a good point when you said, feel the resistance points. Mm-hmm. And so when you're thinking about where should I start setting my boundaries, think about what is causing you the most stress right now. Mm-hmm. Is there a boundary that can be set around that? I'm thinking even like aging parents, you know, a lot of people are taking care of aging parents and, um, sometimes creating boundaries around like when you're visiting them, when Mm -hmm. you're checking in with them, all of that can help easy things for me are boundaries around email. I do not Mm -hmm. check my email 10 times a day anymore. I check it in the morning and I check it like before I'm done working, I check Mm -hmm. it at least once a day and that is enough. Um, so boundaries around social media, boundaries Mm -hmm. around time wasters, TV, like, you know, if you have big goals to reach, you can still watch TV and use social media and reach your goals, but you're going to have to create boundaries around them and, and monitor yeah. your time. So, yeah. all right. The next one, probably my favorite, um, stop negative self-talk and limiting beliefs. I mm-hmm. uh, can't tell it. Oh my gosh. Like I do you like, first off, do you struggle with negative self-talk at all? I do. I do. I find sound like to you. Um, I'll make a lot of excuses in my head and I notice it. And then I'm like, Lydia, Mm -hmm. what are you doing? (laughs) You're, you're, you're making excuses for yourself or, um, a lot of times I'll, you know, I might be on the phone with a friend or something and, or on a video with them and I'll say, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, let's say they see my kitchen and let's say it's really messy. Mm. I'm like, Oh, sorry. You know, my kitchen looks terrible. And then it, it's like, no, in reality, I have an eight month old that just got done eating. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, the kitchen's a mess and that's life in this current moment and that's okay. Mm. But I'm already making excuse of, 
oh, the kitchen looks terrible, then oh, I must not be a good enough mom because I can't, I can't clean the kitchen fast enough and be able to do this and, you know, move on to the next thing. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's the kitchen's messy, right? To, you know, that's, that's just a blanket statement. Not, it looks terrible. Take out that, that negative adjective, just my kitchen's a little messy right now and I'm going to clean it later, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, that's a very basic example, obviously, but I find myself, I even sometimes do it um, where I, I say that negative thought or think it, I may not say it, but I think it. Um, and I, I'm better with this than I used to be, but it takes time. But I think what is better is the fact that I'm aware of it now. Yeah. Before right. it just used to be my narrative inside my head. I would, you know, it, it was almost like I used the, I poorly used my negative self-talk as the way to achieve my goals. Yes. And yeah. that was so counterproductive and didn't make me feel good. <laughs> yeah. Some people are, they motivate themselves with negative self-talk. And I think that perhaps growing up, Mm -hmm. They were motivated by guilt or shame or, oh, you should have done that. Um, oh, why didn't you do that? Or Sally did that better than you. Right. And so you're always using that energy of guilt, shame, comparison mm -hmm. to as your fuel mm -hmm. to take action. And again, right. what is the energy behind that? So, right. yeah, I think I hear a lot of like, I'm so fat. Not mm -hmm. from my head, but from our clients. Right. I'm so fat. I'm so ugly. Who would mm -hmm. ever love me? Who would ever mm -hmm. want to be with me? Mm -hmm. I hate my body. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard that one. That one makes me so sad because your body is such a gift. Mm -hmm. It is a gift to your spirit to experience this life. Mm -hmm. And so when you say you hate your body, don't expect your body to <laughs> do right. what you want it to do. <laughs> I mean, hello. Um, so I think that that's really important that we get over these limiting thoughts. We have an entire module in our course. It really outlines our process for identifying, um, your limiting thoughts, but then changing them. And I think we become desensitized to mm -hmm. our limiting thoughts. And that's where coaching either one-on-one -on -one or in office hours can be so beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a mindset coaching session with a communication program that I'm in recently. And it, I was like, okay, I'm kind of a mindset coach. So I'm not sure how much I'm going to get out of it, but I got mm -hmm. a lot of it. Um, because we, whatever we're exposed to a lot, we become desensitized to. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like if you live next to a railroad track, I grew up in North Platte, Nebraska. So it's a mm -hmm. big railroad town. You get desensitized to the noise of the trains. Right. If you live close to an airport, you get desensitized to the noise of the airplanes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we ever get desensitized to the noise of a crying child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe Miss Joyce, who's our dear daycare provider, or was before we moved. She, you know, after 30 years, maybe she's desensitized. Right. Maybe then. <laughs> maybe then. Um, you know, but we are desensitized to our own limiting thoughts because mm -hmm. they are always on the background. Mm -hmm. And I think journaling has been really effective for me to find my own limiting thoughts, but also just coaching. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think seeing them in other people, like mm -hmm. in office hours, I think that's the benefit of coming and listening is like, you don't always identify them, them in yourself, but like when someone else is saying it and you're like, oh yeah, I think that way too. If it's a limiting thought for them, it's probably a limiting thought for me. Like, right. when you that. but go ahead. What were you going to say? I, um, I have a friend and we, um, were, each other's own negative self-talk, like accountability person. So if we're talking with one another, just having a regular conversation, we'll kindly interrupt the other person and say, oh, you're doing it. You know, and that sometimes that can be helpful to have someone, you know, as part of your support system say, hey, if you notice I'm starting to say things like X, Y, or Z out loud, I may not even realize it and I need to become aware of it so I can change it. If you recognize it, will you point it out to me and I'll do the same for you. And that can sometimes just be helpful because, you know, if you are numb to it, you know, and desensitized to it, you might need some external cue to say, Oh, you know, there comes, there's that negative self-talk. Let's, let's change that. Yeah. And I think when people are like, well, how do I know if I have limiting thoughts around something because they're often hiding, like in our mm -hmm. subconscious brain, you want to look for the rocks in your life. Right. So look for what you don't like about your life. 
maybe you haven't reached the the weight that you want or the health that you want Mm -hmm. or the financial freedom that you want or the relationships that you want or the career that you want. If you don't have what you want, there's a sign that there's a limiting thought in the way preventing you from getting there. And it's like a rock and you have to lift up that rock and look under it. Mm -hmm. What I notice is that a lot of limiting thoughts have patterns of language. So in coaching, we look at language Mm -hmm. patterns a lot, like just like in physical therapy, where we're taught to look at movement patterns. I think as mindset coaches, we look at language patterns. So Mm -hmm. some really common ones that I see are, I can't, I don't know how Mm -hmm. I don't have, and then insert whatever thing they don't have time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the money to spend right now. I don't have the resources to work out. I don't have the support system. I should, like I catch myself doing this one a little bit or I need to, um, are another mm-hmm. one. And, um, the word, but like, I want to exercise, but I don't have, so there's like the two, but I right. don't have time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then anytime someone says I'm, I am, mm-hmm. that is a huge indicator for where their subconscious mind is at. Mm -hmm. So I'm so stressed out right now. It's like, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not stressed. You're having a feeling of being stressed. Mm -hmm. You're experiencing a temporary feeling of stress Mm -hmm. caused by a thought that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's unwind all that and let's think a different thought. And then you won't experience the emotion of stress. Right. But when you use those identity-based statements of I am, your brain pays attention and goes about proving ways to make that your reality. You know, it's like the, it's the law of attraction at work with your thoughts. I'm so tired. I'm so stressed. Um, I'm so sick. Mm -hmm. That's hard. You know, those are hard to overcome because they are truly your reality Mm -hmm. that recognize you have the power to change your reality. Um, any other big, uh, thought patterns that you've recognized in coaching for limiting thoughts? Um, no, I I think the ones you mentioned are are pretty spot on. The only other thing I would say is not only language, but being um, aware of tone Mm -hmm. in the, you know, and um, inflection in someone's voice. And, you know, they may say something, um, they may say a statement that sounds fine, but how they say it in the, you know, the inflection in their voice is a dead giveaway of, what are they really thinking? <laughs> yes. Like, um, my cousin, my dear cousin, Maggie always uh, had this expression fine, which mm. stands for feelings. I'm not expressing. I love this. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, so Maggie could say I'm fine. And it's like, well, are you? No, you're not right. Right. I'm fine. How are you? You know, those mm-hmm. are totally different energetic. So you're listening to the tone, which is essentially the energy mm-hmm. behind the thought behind the word expressed body language, I think is also important. Like oh, for yeah. my son, right? Like he didn't have, he doesn't always have the, um, the language skills or the emotional reasoning mm-hmm. skills to tell me exactly how he's feeling, but I can see that he has closed body language. He was hiding his face from me. Mm-hmm. That's the sign of embarrassment or shame. If someone cancels a coaching session, like that's probably a sign that something's not going well and they don't want to talk right. about it. Right. Um, so I think all of those are good signs of limiting thoughts, but awesome. Okay. The last one on my list um, before we get to it, any like final ones on your list of things to stop doing before we get to this last one? I don't think so. We covered most of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one is cool. It kind of is the, oh, the embodiment of our Zilly choices, which is stop making decisions for current you. And this whole notion of set your future self up for success Mm-hmm. is so awesome to me. Like, mm-hmm. why do I make my bed in the morning? So that my future self in however many hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, I don't know how long it is between wake up and bedtime. Right. So my future self has a lovely bed to get into. Why did I do my dishes this morning before getting on this podcast episode? So that I didn't have to do them later today. Right. You know, like if we can, re- why do we exercise today? So that my 80 year old version of myself can get up from a chair independently. Mm -hmm. Why do I eat healthy food at this meal so that I have energy to play with my kids later? Like, why do I make healthy choices now so that I can enjoy a a high quality of life and a good health span and all that stuff. So that's what it means to me. I have a really cool thought to share with you, but I want to hear what it means to you first. Well, so my, my question before, before I share anything is almost like a devil, a devil's advocate. 
if someone said to you, okay, so I shouldn't make decisions for current me, but then I, I, what was it? Our number two is stop focusing on the distance ahead. I could see someone saying, well, I'm not supposed to make decisions for current me, but I'm also not supposed to look at the future. Where am I supposed to make decisions for? So what, how do you navigate that? Yeah. So I don't view, um, making decisions for future you as Mm -hmm. looking at the gap at all. Mm -hmm. I view it as like an active choice that we're making in the present moment Mm -hmm. that serves our future self. And I think they're pretty obvious, right? Like let's take money. If, if you make $10,000, what's a wiser use of that money? Mm -hmm. Are you going to spend it on a vacation or you could invest it and see returns for years to come so that the future year, maybe that turns into a hundred thousand dollars that the future you can spend. I'm not saying that you have to do that with your money, just an example. So I totally get what you're saying, but I think it's the difference of attention. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not comparing like the future version of yourself and saying like, oh, I have so far to go. It's saying, Mm -hmm. how can I serve that version of myself? Yeah. Um, No, that makes sense. I just wanted to clarify that in case people were confused about, well, where am I supposed to focus then? (laughs) Oh, I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> you have such good insights. And I, I hope people are appreciating that. Like I'm I'm very picky about who I bring into my world. And I'm so grateful that you're in my world and you just ask the best questions and have the best insights. And I'm really, really enjoying having you on this well, podcast. I'm happy to be here. I think it's fun <laughs> to bounce all of our stories, our energy, our experiences off of each other. So yeah. Yeah, this definitely stemmed from a phone call. Like we were just it talking did. on the phone and we were like, I was on a walk and I'm like, oh my gosh, but why don't we just start like recording podcasts about what we're talking about? Because maybe someone else is interested. Okay. So this is the interesting thought that I read this morning. Um, and it's like, you know, stop making decisions for current you. Why is that so hard? Mm-hmm. It's such an easy principle. Make your bed, clean your house, mm-hmm. eat healthy food, go to bed on time exercise regularly, Mm -hmm. practice stress management. Why is it so hard to do? And this is, um, such a passion of mine. So this book is called discover the power within you, a guide to the unexplored depths within, um, by Eric Butterworth. And I always say, I don't care what religion people are. This is, um, I think a lot of, I've read a lot of like books on religion. It's just kind Mm -hmm. of a I've always been interested in it. This one, it talks about the theology of Jesus instead of the theology about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it goes into like his teaching, but it weaves it. It does so in a way that like brings in the laws of, you know, the universe, law of attraction, the law of vibration, all that stuff, which I'm super interested in. So whatever faith background you are, if you're interested in mastering your mindset, if you're interested in really discovering the power of your thought. It's a good Mm -hmm. read so far. I'm about halfway through. So there, he was talking about the Beatitudes and this is kind of from that, that one, um, in physics to move, I'm reading by the way. So in physics to move something that is still, or to stop something that is in motion, you must overcome inertia. The inertial force holds a thing in rest or in motion until it is acted upon by an external force. There is a kind of mental inertia that resists any change for even the effort to improve your life will necessitate coming to grips with the states of mind that have directed the kind of life you are now experiencing. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, um, wherever there is temptation, so think about like temptation, not eat sugar. Very simple example. Where there, wherever there is temptation, there is aspiration. Wherever there is a conscious over human weakness, there is an evidence of an awakening divinity. So this book is essentially like if you follow Christianity, like the Holy Spirit or like spirit or source energy within you, that's what this book is about. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was really cool to have them talk about inertia. And like, why is behavior change so hard? Because we get in these mental rhythms and we have to break that inertia. We are either Mm -hmm. stagnant or we are moving in a direction that we don't want to go. And, you know, I'm not going to read this whole chapter at all, but there was a line in there that said something about, oh, I think your, your vision. Oh yeah. So unshakable faith and vision 
can help overcome this inertial pull. So we have to have faith in your ability to do this. Mm -hmm. We have to have a vision and what you want to move towards to break you out of this current like rhythm that you're in. And I think that that helps create that energy that's necessary to. Yeah. Right. So I think that's kind of where that I was thinking about our personal faith formula process. Mm -hmm. Like how do we, how do we break people's current inertial state, whether they're Mm -hmm. stagnant or whether they're moving in the wrong direction, we have to help them envision their future self Mm -hmm. and love that version of themselves and move towards that version of themselves. But so I think that's the power of that personal faith formula. Like you said, creating it, reading it, that creates that energy to pull Mm -hmm. you out of your current state and into this new state of being that you, that you desire to be. So That's cool. I don't want to get too like spiritual or religious or anything like that. Cause I don't want any haters on the podcast, leaving weird comments, but <laughs> respect my, respect my, um, respect my words here. Know that this is coming from a, the, a place of service to anybody who's interested in and never want to press my beliefs on someone else, but I do believe in the power of thought. So mm-hmm. Any mm-hmm. other like ending thoughts on that one? I don't, I just, I had never thought of the concept of mental inertia before. I just, I, I feel like my mind's blown. I haven't, you know, and the fact that all of your thoughts are, I just, I, I picture all of your thoughts kind of just scattered, you know, and everything's kind of coming down into one big ball of like, and of internal energy that is then going to lead you into the action. Mm-hmm. that you're wanting. I, I don't know. It's very, it's a very cool way of thinking about it. <laughs> yes. Mental inertia. That's a mental inertia thought until next yeah. week. We're talking about mental mastery. Um, I also love all of your analogies and like how you're such a visual thinker. So I'm I a love big, I write, my hands are moving. <laughs> I love it. All right, guys, we hope that you found this episode helpful. Um, and please share it with a friend. If you found it helpful, um, let us know. You can message me on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Morgan Nolte. Let me know what you found most helpful about today's episode and we'll talk with you again soon.